practice of the Buddhist teachings can be called the serious pursuit of true happiness, with the emphasis on the serious and the true. Serious not in the sense of grim, but in the sense of sincere. Not being willing to let, settle for anything less than what's true. True here means a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness that doesn't let you down. This is why so many of the Buddhist teachings focus on suffering, because most of the happiness or the things that we take for happiness in daily life really do end up causing suffering as they change. Because so many times the happiness we gain turns into something else, and the happiness it turns into pain. As the Buddha said, is it a noble thing to search for that kind of happiness? Is it a wise, skillful thing to search for that kind of happiness as an end in and of itself? If you know it's going to let you down at some point, why put so much effort into it? That's the question he asked himself. It's a question that led him to go off into the, into the woods, into the wilderness, to find if there was a true happiness that could be gained through human effort. This is why we have this chant. We chant so regularly on aging, illness, death, separation. If you stop right there, it gets very, dis very depressing. But it's reflection on these things that led the Buddha to go out into the wilderness. It was also the fifth, though, that gave him the encouragement to go. The first four encouraged a feeling of what was called sangwega, a sense of dismay over the way of ordinary life, the pointlessness of so many things that we do, and a sense of urgency over wanting to find a way out. The fifth reflection is what gives rise to a sense of what they call basada, or confidence. Whatever we do for good or for evil, to that will we fall heir. Is there a skillful way of action, he asked himself, that could lead beyond this constant wandering on, this constant gaining and losing, coming together and falling apart? That's so typical of our ordinary lives. And after the course of six years, he found that, yes, there is a way. And that's what he had to taught. That's what he had to teach for the rest of his life. That one thing that was so important, that it was worth giving his whole life to. That the search of, for true happiness is not a futile search. He said that basically when we run up against suffering, when we run up against all the problems in our lives, there are two reactions. One is a sense of bewilderness. Why is this happening? Often, why is this happening to me? And then there's a search. Is there somebody who knows a way out? And because those two go together, the bewilderment and the search, oftentimes we look in the wrong places. Of course, they're confused even on what happiness is, what, what suffering is. So when he taught the Four Noble Truths, he said, with regard to the first truth, this is the task that you want to accomplish, is to comprehend suffering, to understand, okay, what is it that's creating such a burden on the mind? He finally came down to the fact that there are two kinds of suffering. There's the stress in the changefulness in things in life, but there are also the stress and suffering that we cause ourselves unnecessary over those changes unnecessarily over those changes. That's the issue, because once that suffering is wiped out, then the changes don't impinge on the mind at all. Like that teaching of John Sawatz that I've repeated many times, over the, the mountain over there on the eastern horizon, is it heavy, he would say. And his answer would be, well, if you try to pick it up, yes. If you don't try to pick it up, it's not heavy for you. It may be heavy in and of itself, but if you don't pick it up, that doesn't impinge on you. It's not an issue for you. And it's the same with ourselves as we, as we sit here. What demands are being placed on you? All, that you? all that's being asked is that you sit relatively still for the hour and breathe and watch the breath. Stay with the breath. The breath comes in, know that it's coming in. When it goes out, know that it's going out and breathe as comfortably as you can. There are several ways of working with this. Try breathing deep and long in and out for a while. And if you notice any parts of the body that feel tense with a long breath, well, try to relax them. 
or you can change the rhythm of your breathing. Experiment to see what feels good right now. For so often we allow ourselves to breathe in ways that are uncomfortable, and yet nobody's forcing us to do this. It's just that we're not paying attention. We don't usually think that there's anything there to pay attention to. Yet the energy of the breath is our basic energy in life. It stands to reason that if the breath energy is good, the body will be healthier, the mind will be more at ease. It has a better place to stay. So that's all that's asked of you. And yet we manage to develop all kinds of problems around us. There's pain in the legs. We can get all worked up about it. Even though as soon as we you know this, as soon as we get up, change positions, the pain is going to go away. And it's not harmful pain. It's not going to cause your leg to fall off or to get gangrene or anything like that. And yet the mind can create all kinds of scenarios, tor torturing itself, tormenting itself. Or you can drag in things from the past, worries about the future. Even this, this much can show you how clearly you just create all kinds of unnecessary suffering for yourself, just sitting right here. The purpose of the meditation is to find out why, how it happens, and also how you can not do it, how you can drop these habits of the mind that cause us so much unnecessary suffering. The texts talk about three types of seclusion. You come out here and you're basically alone. You don't deal with that many people. And so all the burdens of constant social contact are cut away quite a bit. You're not totally alone, but during the course of the day when you're out under the trees, there you are, alone. That in and of itself lightens a lot of the burdens on the body. That's just called physical seclusion, though, because you find often that your mind is not secluded. It's dragging in all kinds of events. As the, mind, as the Buddha said, we live with craving as our companion. We want to think about this, want to think about that. Even if we don't want to think about that, these things come up and we grab hold of them out of habit. So the first step is to cut away past and future and just be with the present moment. Use the breath as your anchor. When you're with the breath, you know you're in the present. And you have the tools for dealing with whatever discomfort does arise in the present moment. You can either breathe in ways that minimize suffering or actually become actively refreshing, satisfying, absorbing. You find with this simple act of staying with the breath as you Stay with it longer and longer and longer, and just try to keep yourself as sensitive as possible to how the breathing feels. Making a little adjustment here, a little adjustment there. There's a sense of ease that comes without your having to think about giving rise to it independently. It's just there from the continuity of your focus, the sensitivity of your focus. There can even be a sense of rapture, a sense of fullness. You breathe in feeling really refreshed, breathe out feeling really refreshed. The more you get absorbed in the present moment like this, the further and further away the past and the future seem to be. This is a step above simple physical seclusion, because you find that once, you main, once you've learned to recognize this spot and learned how to maintain it in this secluded place, you can test. Can you maintain it in another context as well? Get up and walk around. Can you maintain that same sense of being centered as you're walking, doing other work around the, around the place, as you're talking with other people? This is where you see a lot of the tricks the mind plays with itself, worrying, what is that person thinking about me? How can I impress this person? Nobody here wants to be impressed, and yet everybody's trying to impress everybody else. When you learn how to drop that, you know how to sort of be yourself around others, be centered around others. You find life is lighter both for yourself and for the people around you. 
and you work step by step to try to maintain the same steady sense of center, whatever the context, whatever the situation. So that even when you're not in physical seclusion, the mind is secluded. It's no longer running after the future, running after the past. But it still has craving as its companion. That's the final level of seclusion is when you can get rid of that. And the commentaries call this upati viveka, which means being secluded from the mind's acquisitions or the mind's baggage, all this baggage you carry around. In other words, your cravings, your clingings, your conceits, your ignorance. You dig into the present moment and find exactly what's happening here. How is it that the mind can still create suffering and stress even here, when you're centered in the present moment? It's very subtle. At that point, it's hard to call it suffering. It seems more like just simple stress. But as you focus on what's happening, you begin to see, oh, you're doing this that's unnecessary, you're doing that that's unnecessary. It's like a little child learning how to walk. When it first walks around, it not only moves its legs, but also moves its arms and sometimes its head, stiffens up its neck. It gets all kinds of unnecessary muscles involved, because it really doesn't understand, okay, what's necessary and what's not. But as it gets better and better about walking and more and more observant, it begins to say, well, it doesn't have to move its arms in that way, it doesn't have to stiffen up its head in that way. It can be begin to relax different parts of the body until Walking is not such a major, major effort. It's the same with the meditation. As we center the mind, when we start out, we find that we're doing all kinds of unnecessary things. We don't realize it at the time, but we are. To keep the mind strapped down in the present moment, sometimes forcing it too much, sometimes thinking, well, you have to pull the breath here or pull the breath there or force the mind here or tense this there or tense that there. And then you begin to realize that's not necessary. And you begin to let go. Just let go of those activities. And the act of centering the mind becomes more natural. Seems you're at more at ease in the present moment. And you get clearer and clearer about what you're doing. And it's through peeling these layers away that you get to a point where ultimately you let go of that companion here in the present moment. So the mind is truly secluded. At that point, it goes beyond even time and space. There's another dimension that it touches. That's when you learn what it's like to be truly free of the stress and suffering you create for yourself. That's when you have your first taste of what it's like to be find true happiness, true ease, true well-being. So the, the practice takes you step by step by step from all your entanglements and all this unnecessary suffering that you cause yourself, peels them away, strips them away, layer by layer by layer. Do you find that what the Buddha taught was true? Yes. You can, through your own efforts, come to the spot where the mind opens up to this other dimension that he calls deathless free from aging, free from illness, free from death, free from separation. So even though the Buddha may often talk about stress and suffering, in fact, it's his first noble truth, it's what all Four Noble Truths, the issue that all Four Noble Truths center around. It's aimed in the direction of true happiness, because it makes sure that it is true. The Four Noble Truths are there for, to test anything that's false. It's like those stones they used to use in the past to test for what was true gold and what wasn't. You hold on to that stone to test everything that comes your way because you want the gold. Once you've got the gold, though, then you can put it aside. So this is what we're here for. We have that chant, may I be happy, may I be free from stress and pain. We chant that every night before the meditation to remind ourselves that's why we're here, for true happiness. And it reminds us to look at all the things that we do throughout the day to get in the way of that wish. I mean, it's, our, it's one of our most sincere wishes, and yet we're always doing things to block it, to get in the way. So try to keep it in mind, to keep checking, what are you doing that's getting in the way of true happiness? 
or the unnecessary things that so often we feel we just can't do without. It's a built-in part of our personality, but it doesn't have to be. It may have deep roots, but it can be uprooted, these habits we have. So we're working on the skills right now that can uproot them. So we can reach the point where we're, we're not causing ourselves or the people around us any unnecessary stress or pain. It may sound simple, it may sound even kind of small-minded and small-hearted for a spiritual goal, but if you actually follow the process, you, f you see that it takes you beyond what you might have imagined. How true is true happiness? Well, follow the process. Be sensitive, be observant, be ingenious in the practice, and you'll find out.